this one. Over here on our side. And they're just missing, missing out, man. Okay. The House Transportation, Mobility, and Infrastructure Committee will come to order. Would the clerk please take attendance? Chair Shannon. Present. Representatives McDonald. Here. Coleman. Here. Conlon. Here. Farhat. Here. Fitzgerald. Here. Hoskins. Here. Miller. Here. Altman. Roth. Brock. Zoom. Zoom. Koontz. Here. St. Germain. Here. Mr. Chair, you have 10 members present. You do have a quorum. I need a motion to adopt minutes from the last meeting, April 19th. Representative St. Germain makes that motion. Seeing no opposition, the minutes are adopted. Well, welcome everyone today. Uh, first of all, we'll start off with a, we have a few things to, on our agenda. First, we'll start off with a brief presentation by the RTA. Uh, and we are going to be taking testimony uh, later only on uh, House Bills 4515 and a package of bills uh, uh, 4352 and 4353. Um, and so, first of all, we'll go ahead and bring up uh, the RTA to do their brief presentation. And thank you, Paul Anderson, Karen. Okay, I have this. Ben Stupka. All right, we'll get it in order here. Thank you, Ben, for coming in. Thank the you. And you got yours. the pronunciation right, so you're already oh, winning great. in my book. Excellent, like Stupka. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, uh, members of the committee. Thank you so much for letting us present here today. I'll walk through our annual legislative report, give you some highlights about what the RTA is working on, and happy to answer any questions. Uh, so on an annual basis, we, uh, the RTA does present a report to the legislature um, just documenting the actions over the last year. Um, so we did present that just due on March 31st. So um, hopefully you have copies of that, and I'll just walk through it. So uh, RTA overview, uh, RTA was established at Public Act 387 in 2012, uh, includes a four county region covering Macomb, Oakland, Washtenaw, and Wayne counties. It is governed by a 10 member board that has two representatives from each one of those counties, an additional representative from the city of Detroit, those are the nine voting members. The chair is appointed by the governor and is, serves as a non-voting member. Uh, you'll see the names of the board of directors there on the side and where they represent. The RTA's mission uh, is to manage and secure transportation resources that significantly enhance mobility options to improve quality of life for residents and increase economic viability for the region. We envision a region with sufficient and stable funding to support improved public transit options and will advance equity by increasing accessibility, satisfy the integrated mobility needs of Southeast Michigan communities and promote livable, healthy, and sustainable growth. Um, a little quick synopsis of where the RTA has been and where it is, um, as briefly as I can make it. Uh, really, the agency was established in 2015 with full staff. Um, 2015 and 2016 was an exciting time uh, where we pulled together a regional master plan uh, that consisted of uh, bus rapid transit lines on major corridors, commuter rail projects, increases in bus frequency, extensions of services, uh, the largest investment in new mobility um, in, in the state and in the nation, um, and ran that master plan as part of a ballot initiative in 2016 that very narrowly lost. Um, so 2017 and 2018, we re reworked the, that plan. Um, we looked at including more uh, local community services. We looked at increasing the amount of technology that was embedded in that plan, looking at AVs, electric vehicles, those types of things. Um, we were not able to get on a ballot in 2018. Uh, but during that time, we were able to launch uh, the Reflex service, which turned into the FAST service, which are corridor services on Woodward, Gratiot, and Michigan, serving Southeast Michigan. These are the most successful services in terms of ridership that we've had in the region in a very long time. Um, so the RTA was able to work in partnership with Smart and DDOT to launch those services. And pre-pandemic, they were seeing 50% ridership increases, particularly on the weekends. Uh, where we see a lot of people have need uh, for those services. We were also able to work with, DART, uh, with DDOT and SMART to unify their fare structure. Um, so they have a system called DART um, that allows people to use a mobile phone and other means to access both of their services. So this was a huge barrier before, so there's now a seamlessly integrated fare system. So there's some of the things that we're doing in the background trying to make things better. 2019 and 2020, uh, there was some um, legislation to look at uh, different municipal partnerships to see if we could advance uh, regional funding. 
Uh, those were not successful, and then the pandemic hit, of course. Um, in that time, uh, the RTA completed the first Coordinated Human Services Transportation Plan. I did not name it. That is what the federal government calls it. I swear I would never name anything that. Um, but this is a plan focused on uh, services for seniors and people with disabilities and really looks at nonprofits and uh, small local communities that are providing those services. So that was the first regional plan that was done. We're going to be updating that uh, next year. We also launched the D2A2 service, which is a, an express bus connection between Ann Arbor and Detroit, uh, the first ever real transit connection uh, between those two uh, entities. And um, that service is still operating very successfully and growing in ridership on a monthly basis. Um, we, uh, in just in the last year, saw some great success uh, locally. Both uh, AAATA was able to pass uh, millage renewal and an expansion in their, in their Ann Arbor service area. And of course, Oakland County was able to uh, uh, pass a millage to include all of their county as part of the transit district there. So some good local successes, good, um, you know, good small victories here and there, but not necessarily the big regional victory. Transit services in Southeast Michigan. So we talked about uh, SMART, which serves suburban Oakland, Macomb, and Wayne counties. Uh, DDOT, which serves the city of Detroit. Uh, the ride in Ann Arbor, the Q line and the people mover downtown. You also see on this map, lots of small community level services that we work with, Richmond, Lenox, EMS, and Star in Macomb County, WODA, and NODA, and Oakland County, People's Express, The Wave. These are services that we work with on a consistent basis. In fact, we're managing some funding right now, um, some federal funding that uh, the RTA has oversight over to make investments in the continuing operations and expansions of those services. So I like to say the RTA does four things. Um, it funds, plans, coordinates, and accelerates. So the funding, uh, our role in funding is we're what's called the designated recipient. So all of the federal and state funding that goes to the transit providers throughout the region come through the RTA. Um, we do planning, so we look at doing not only the regional master plan, setting a strategic agenda for the region and how we want to advance, but also small corridor studies, um, different types of uh, action plans, things of that nature. Uh, we coordinate, so we work on an almost daily basis with the, with the transit providers, um, trying to find those opportunities, both big and small, to help advance their goals, their local needs, what they need to do with their customers and their service areas. So I like to draw this distinction between what the providers do, which is operate the service and own and maintain the vehicles and the strategic agenda that the RTA is advancing. The final piece of this is really acceleration. It's picking those, those regional goals and seeing what we can do to take some grant funding, take some local funding, and advance those things. So something like the D2A2 service is a great example of that role we play. Some accomplishments, we talked about D2A2. We were able to complete a Detroit workforce equity analysis. Um, SMART was able to expand its flex service, which is on-demand service in several zones throughout its service area. One of the very few in the country that has a robust on-demand system for uh, the general public. Very, very innovative service and something that's grown. Uh, we were re recently awarded a grant to do the first pilot uh, express bus connection between the airport and downtown Detroit, which is, if you guys have ever seen those word clouds, like, where do you want to go with transit? Like, airport is always just huge right in the middle. So we we're able to find some funding. We'll have funding for about a year. We're going to continue to look for how to sustain that, but that should be launching around this time next year. Uh, DDOT and the ride have been gone, just recently gone through both uh, reimaginings of their system and how they want to deliver uh, their services. Uh, Gratiot and Washtenaw um, are being looked at for improvements th through MDOT studies. Uh, we're doing a 5310 call for projects. That's the funding I referenced earlier. Uh, DDOT and SMART have uh, launched electric bus pilots. We uh, received a grant from the state of Michigan from MDOT to launch a mobility wallet pilot. So this is a, uh, a a program that allows for people to pay for multiple mobility services from one bank account and also allows for multiple people to fund that account. So if you kind of picture a wallet with multiple streams coming in and multiple things going out, um, this will be the first of its kind uh, in the country. Uh, so we're about to launch that pilot project in the next month. Uh, we have some funding for an access to transit grant program. Uh, again, kind of a first of its kind in this region where uh, we're going to be funding bike and pedestrian improvements at regional transit stops. Um, so we were able to work with SEMCOG, our local MPO, to find some funding to really make those smaller investments. 
uh, discussed the AAATA millage, Oakland County. Uh, we also supported MDOT in their Michigan Avenue's ra raise grant to do uh, CAV and bus only lanes at Michigan Avenue in the Corktown area of Detroit. Key upcoming initiatives, uh, we have a call for project uh, for some American Rescue Plan funding for regional investments coming out of COVID and part of economic recovery. Um, we're doing our senior and disabled call for, uh, uh, call for projects now. Uh, working with MDOT and their corridor projects, looking at opportunities for bus rapid transit um, and other investments that are transit positive in those, uh, in those corridors, the access to transit program, airport shuttle, mobility wallet grant. And we're starting to look into uh, what we can do to support um, growing and sustaining the transit workforce. As with most other industries, uh, the, the transit workforce is, uh, was already kind of in a, a decline, um, just as with people retiring, um, just again, typical of a lot of other industries. The pandemic, of course, exacerbated that. Um, so this is right now presently one of the largest, if not the largest challenge we're having is just having operators and having people to be able to run the schedules. Um, the providers are doing everything they can, um, and we want to be able to support them um, hopefully working in partnership with workforce development agencies and looking at how we make a, a transit career a more robust career option. So that's something we're just starting to get into now. Legislative items. Uh, so certainly one of the things that we love to be able to talk about is flexibility for the RTA. So how can we have uh, use the tools that we have to be more flexible and allow for more funding to come into the region from a local funding source? Um, state funding for capital projects, particu particularly to leverage federal funding. Um, for those dynamic corridor projects, um, certainly anything uh, that we can do to support local bus operating funding, uh, funding to support D2A2 and other regional services, and always looking for opportunities to sustain the RTA administration. Um, we've been very lucky that uh, we've been able to secure grant funds and be uh, fairly stable, and we'll be fairly stable for the next several years by just being able to look for those options. That is what I have. I'll go back to the first slide because it's probably the best one. There we go. And it should say May on there, sorry. Well, thank, you so much. thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, very informative. Uh, I don't seem to have any questions. Representative Coons. Mr. Chairman, this is almost trivial. I'm sorry. What is a CAV? Oh, uh, Connected and Autonomous Vehicles. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. That was the only acronym I used the whole time. I'm pretty proud of myself. And that's, that's all the only sin I committed, <laughs> acronym sin. And I, I, I just want to want to add one thing, just a comment that uh, I had uh, an event in Detroit a couple months ago, and I wanted to, see, you know, being chair of the transportation committee, I wanted to see, you know, how easy it would be for me to get to downtown Detroit. Um, well, I'll tell you that uh, the direct route to downtown Detroit, it, the, I, mean, I could have gotten there, but I would have had to leave at like 6 in the morning and it could come back maybe at 4.30 or something like that, which just really was a little bit, um, you know, a little bit, uh, not, not frustrating, but uh, disappointing. Unconducive and, to your lifestyle. Yes, what you but, want to do. The yeah. one, but I do <laughs> want to make a good comment, though, is that a positive comment is that the flex system was really cool. I live yeah. very close to a mall that has... Uh, uh, it, it's, it's sort of the regional transit hub of Macomb County, I would say. And that flex system, when I put it in there and made a request, they were going to be to my house in like 10 minutes. So that was really cool. So I do, I do think that that's a, a program with, uh, worth continuing. So I yep. just wanted to make that comment without any other comments. Representative Con Conlon. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking, how much is this all a part of the Michigan Healthy Plan? Just because when I look at... I look at everything, and this is huge in terms of economic development. I have three children who live in cities who would move back, I think, to Detroit if there was public transport that could move them around better. It's a talent pipeline for our young people who want to live in urban centers. I also think of our roads and, and all of the traffic and weight on our roads, and if we could have more public transport, that would be better there. So I just, I'm just i all for EVs and our buses being EVs, but I am a real public um, you know, transport person. Absolutely. So this is a key part of the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan. There are goals within that plan to, I believe it's increased public transit usage by 15% um, over whatever the lifespan of the plan is. Uh, I will say uh, there was a conference for the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan maybe two or three weeks ago, and they actually had a panel dedicated to talking about transit's role uh, beyond the EV part, but just straight kind of what is transit's role in, in this? Um, and I was serving that panel. A couple other people who are here today probably um, were on that panel as well. So um, it's definitely a conversation that's happening in that space and a conversation that's happening in the 
um, kind of the connected and autonomous vehicle EV space. So we're, we're trying to connect into those two conversations that are happening at the state level and, and make sure that we're part of those conversations and just good, basic, solid, frequent transit service is you know, going to advance so many different, um, different agendas that we have. Thank you so much, Ben, for your presentation. Thank I appreciate you. you coming in today. Up next, we'll be taking uh, testimony only on House Bill 4515. Uh, Representative Hill and Karen Middendorp uh, with the Michigan Snowmobile and ORV Association would like to join us. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good morning to my fellow members of the House Transportation, Mobility and Infrastructure Committee. Uh, and thank you to the folks who are joining me here today with the um, Michigan Snowmobile and ORV Association. ORV is off-road vehicles, for those keeping track of the acronym uh, <laughs> this morning. Uh, and thank you, Nate, uh, ch sorry, Chair Shannon, to, for giving me the opportunity to present on House Bill 4515. I'm Representative Jen Hill, and I represent the left hand, so we're going to switch now to the Upper Peninsula, uh, but also actually all of, the, all of Michigan. Um, we have a rich culture of outdoor recreation here, and um, this is a new and relatively new and growing part of our recreation uh, activities is the off-road vehicles. I have my Got Trails uh, mug right here with me today. Uh, that's what we're here to talk about, is supporting our incredible trail system in Michigan. Michigan uh, wants to be known as the trail state. We actually uh, go neck and neck with California on having the most trails of any state in the country. And you think about how much bigger California is than we are, that's how important trails are to Michigan. We're gonna talking, uh, House Bill 4515 is, um, a program that supports licensing of off-road vehicles, and th those funds are the funds that helped uh, maintain our trail system, which uh, the folks with me today are going to talk about. This license uh, begins on April 1st and ends on March 31st of the following year. An ORV license is required to, be, to drive your uh, vehicle on public roadways or on a trail in Michigan. It is not required to drive on private property. Um, the license is quite affordable, and we have free ORV weekends as well. The next free weekends are June 10th and 11th and August 19th and 20th. And most importantly, the money that is raised with this license program goes right back into building and maintaining our more than 4,000 miles of trails and six scramble areas where folks can um, uh, en enjoy um, riding up and down the hills and um, and taking those vehicles off-road in all sorts of uh, adventuresome ways. Uh, this is a common sense program that stands to benefit all who enjoy their ORVs and their local communities. Unfortunately, the program was due to sunset, uh, end at, uh, in 2024, and so I'm urging you today uh, to vote in support of House Bill 4515 that removes the sunset provision and ensure that Michigan has its valuable support for these trails for the years to come. I'm gonna turn it over to Karen, who is the executive director of MySorva. You might wanna, yeah, just pull that over. One? Yeah. All right. There you go. Thank you, Representative Hill and the Transportation Committee for your help with our proposal to improve our ORV legislation. I'm happy to be here today as we continue to identify improvements to motorized recreation where we work and play. In the establishment of the ORV legislation, a sunset at or end date was included. Sunset provisions are clauses embedded in legislation that may be may result in law ceasing to exist after a specified time. Sunset provisions are often used during times of uncertainty, as I'm sure was the case when the ORV legislation was installed back in the 90s. A sunset provision <clears throat> can help counteract the uncertainty around some legislation. This clause continues to bring the legislation before our elected officials for renewal. Currently, the legislation is set to expire, as Rep. Yep. Hill said, in uh, April of 2024. House Bill 4515 is a common sense legislation. This will change. This change will remove the end date of the Sunset ORV trail funding program. This statute simply 
The statute change simply allows our ORV permit legislation to live on without an end date. As I'm sure you know, our state state's ORV user group is a pay-to-play recreation. We are happy to pay so we can continue to play in our state. Each side-by-side -side dirt bike, quad, and many other state-licensed vehicles per purchase permits to travel our beautiful trails in Michigan. Each ORV trail permit purchased is valid for a one-year period, renewing on April 1st of each year and expiring March 31st. The permits are purchased, purchased, then deposited into the ORV Trail Improvement Fund. This funding mechanism then is distributed and completes the necessary changes, improvements, signage, maintenance, and construction on the ORV trails in our, through our state through an appropriation of our DNR. The fund also covers the cost of leasing land and acquiring permits and other necessary agreements. Good morning, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Paul Anderson. I am the chairman of the legislative um, committee within my SORBA. I'm here today representing uh, the ORV enthusiast. I am lucky enough to live in northern Michigan where I get to ride ORVs weekly. Um, I'm very involved in many facets of the sport, uh, including representing other users here in Lansing. Uh, the ORV community continues to expand in, a, in large numbers. Uh, bringing tourism dollars to Michigan, uh, northern Michigan primarily, but uh, we need it. Um, my SORBA represents these users, and together with our partners at the DNR, we agree that the time has come to remove this sunset clause and allow the ORB Trail Improvement Fund to remain indefinitely. The change would effectively stop the renewal legislation in the future and save all, save all of us time uh, for more important issues. Um, bottom line is, is that the program, ORVs aren't going anywhere anytime, probably ever. Uh, we're growing and there's no reason to, to do, you know, to have to review it, uh, you know, on the regular. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Just as a, a reminder that we are only taking testimony today and we will take up a vote at a further uh, future date. Uh, but I do have a couple questions. Um, Representative Roth. Thank you guys for coming forward. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for allowing me a question. Paul, Karen, great to see you guys. Mm -hmm. Jen, uh, Hill, uh, Representative Hill, excuse me. Uh, thanks for bringing this Very forward. Very informal today. Everybody's Very first formal, names. I know. We're, we're really, uh, yeah. Um, appreciate this and good to see the sunset removed. Can you tell me um, what went into the decision and how to uh, price this? I, first of all, I want to commend you guys for getting the ORVs and snowmobilers together in a group. That's number one in importance. And I, absolutely. <laughs> and it, it's, it, but it's all good. At least you guys are working together. We don't have to lock you in a room and not let you out. So it's much better. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. Anyway, so. We're trying real uh, hard. Just how did the pricing aspect of it? Or what the trail fee will be? How did they go in? I know snowmobiles a little bit different. They go by the CPI. I'm just curious what your the thoughts were on the ORV pricing. The price hasn't been increased in the last few years. Do we see that coming down? Eventually, yes. There's a large pool of money in the ORV program that there's no provision to spend currently. So to raise that by the CPI is doing nothing but putting a tax on our user groups that they can't spend anyway. So yes, it needs to be done, but I think we need to do our diligence and figure out what that price needs to be first and then move forward with an appropriate amount to buy equipment because right now everything is contracted that they do. Unless a club happens to have a piece of equipment or they're using an old snowmobile piece of equipment, there's that's there is no provision for the clubs to to get equipment like there is in the snowmobile program. Okay, I appreciate it, Paul. Anything that you, uh, you know, basically, we have the program was not prepared for the explosion of ORVs, um, and so the program needs a lot of changes. Increasing the permit right now would be not not the right answer uh, because the, again like Karen said I think we've got 14 million dollars sitting in an account and it keeps going up every year it keeps going up we need to change a whole bunch of stuff so that we can start spending that money so the end user is going to not be real big on a price increase when there's a pretty big surplus so understand that and that's good and, and if we can work with you to 
help it out, I'm sure the chair would be willing to entertain that. Right, and I, and that's what I was going to add on as well. We're definitely interested in in working together, um, the state and the um, the user groups, and the flooding that we're seeing in the UP right now. It's just an example. The um, Iron Ore Heritage Trail, which is a very very popular trail in Marquette County, had a 15 foot lo or even longer now a uh, hole blown in it that um, completely, it, it just stops dead in the middle of the woods. And so we need to get that connectivity back to so that folks can go from town to town. And, uh, and we're really, um, we see a huge need uh, this year for a lot of repairs, a lot of saturated ground and, and flooding uh, damage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Hill, for bringing this forward, and thank you both for your testimony. Uh, I think I agree that these trails should be maintained. Um, I know you, you kind of both, you, you all mentioned it, but how much of a uh, tourism at, uh, impact does this have on your communities? I think it's important to, to highlight that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I can briefly. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know that there's a number. Uh, snowmobiling has been around and it's been a much more established program and a lot of that information has been generated to determine that. Um, ORB, not so much. I can tell you that the way winters have gone and just the amount of people. I live in Traverse City. Um, I live on the outskirts of Traverse City. I have a gas station and a restaurant. And I can tell you the amount of side-by-sides that are in there on the regular, even during the week, is crazy. And that's every, I mean, every town you go to is the same, same deal. So it's making a huge impact uh, on, on the economy. Unfortunately, we don't have any numbers yet. Great, thank you. Right. The out trail permits that we bought, I just got that number and I wish I had it right here in front of me. But I don't. <laughs> I wish I would have brought it. Um, I was very surprised how many, the numbers that I got from, from DNR, because they, they have that. Um, the out-of-state trail permit sales was, was extremely high. Um, out of the 200 and almost 300,000 trail permits that were sold, I want to say just about 100,000 of them were from out-of-staters. That's huge huge because in every side by side generally there's two to four people in there so it isn't just one person coming to buy lunch to stay in motels to to buy gas to visit the stores to buy equipment to it's three or four people for every side by side coming in here it's huge snowmobilers there's generally one on there so it's a little different but side by sides and and our orv programs or a truck coming in that's coming to run Silver Lake. They're coming into um, Drummond Island with, with road vehicles. They're driving up here. They've got three or four people with them. They, they travel together. So it's big. It's, it's, the tourism is amazing of what motorized recreation brings to our state. Thank you. Representative St. Germain. Thank you. Um, I just want to start with, um, I support this bill. Uh, my kids just spent the weekend, last weekend, in Silver Lake. And uh, it's funny, we're talking about off-road trail riding. Um, every year for Mother's Day weekend, we do a girls' trip. We're heading, about 20 of us girls are taking our Orbeez, trailering them, going to uh, Lakes of the North, Mancelona. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All girls. <laughs> Um, so I do see the value, the tourism, you know, um, where I have a place in Houghton Lake, you know, just the, the spending, the, the restaurants and, and the party stores and um, not just us Michiganders, but like you said, people from out of state as well, too. So um, I have a quick question, though, but I don't know if you'll know the answer. I'm going to ask anyway. So let me just ask. So when you buy a trail permit, when you get one, say, from the, a, a party store, um, it looks different than, say, at a, a dealership. Are the funds going to the same place? Is it all the same? They just look differently? Are you, are you talking snowmobile or ORV or both? Both. Okay. Um, the smaller pre-printed permits yeah. are there because people 
have a twenty-five, thirty thousand dollar piece of equipment, and the last thing they want to do is put an ugly sticker on it. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so, we there is a smaller pre-printed permits for snowmobiles. That's what the user group prefers. Are those smaller ones? Um, I think that the ORV are now beginning to realize that yes, there's a smaller one, and they don't have to have that. I think for ORV, the biggest complaint we have from them now is they have to have two, yeah. not one. You have to have two, which is more that will be coming before you because we'd like to change that back to one single permit. That would be nice. One and done. Okay. One and done. Um, it saves costs for printing. It saves costs for the permits. It saves costs for uh, all kinds of things. Um, most people buy two because that's what allows you to be on the trails. So that's why they're buying that permit. But they're exactly the same. They fund the same. They dump into the money the same. Everything's the same, mm -hmm. whether it's a pre-printed or the POS machine, point of sale machine, that's printed out. Okay. That's the only difference. Thank there you. is no difference. Otherwise. One sticks better than the other one, too. Yes. Yes, <laughs> That'd be more yes. Than yes there's that. Yeah. But mainly, I think it's aesthetic. They, they don't like it. It is for me. I don't want I a big, not. ugly sticker. I mean, and they're big. Mm -hmm. They're good size. Oh, I don't want that ugly thing. Just bought thing. ours for Girls Weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't want that ugly thing on my, my brand new cart. It's, you know, it. we spend a lot of money on our toys. We want them to be pretty and fancy and jazzed up, and the last thing we want is a big, ugly sticker on it. But, but the point of sale is nice for those that forget. You know, yeah, right. uh, you know that's the last thing I was thinking of, and they can run into Meyer, yeah. they can run into the Dunhams, they can run into yep. any place that sells hunting licenses, they can get it. So there's definitely, you know, a positive for that. Sure. Yeah. So it, it, it's it's needed for sure. Right. Thanks for all you do. Any other questions? Uh, okay, I got a I have a card to read in. Um, Taylor Ridden. Ritterbush from the DNR wishes not to speak and does not wish to speak, I should say, uh, and supports the bill. So thank you so much for coming today and for your testimony. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so moving on. Uh, the committee will go at ease. Uh, call of the chair. The House Transportation Mobility and Infrastructure Committee will come to order. Chairman Shannon, the floor is yours to discuss HB 4352 and 4353. Thank you, Majority uh, Vice Chair McDonald. So today uh, we have a two bill package, House Bill 4352 and 4353. Um, it would amend the Michigan Vehicle Code and State Trunk Line Highway System Acts by inserting language for the development of HOV or high occupancy vehicle lanes. The background uh, is high, high occupancy vehicle lanes are a transportation man management design tool used to incentivize throughput and reduce travel time for multiple passenger vehicles. It is a specific lane reserved for carpools, van pools, and buses. And under the current state and federal law, eligible vehicles include two or more people in a vehicle, buses, motorcycles, emergency, and law enforcement vehicles. The fine for violating HOV lanes is a civil infraction of at least $250, according to the Michigan Vehicle Code. These lanes allow for swift movement through congestion and encourage ride-sharing modes of transportation. The implementation of HOV lanes has been linked by empirical data and research uh, to other benefits such as reduced air pollution, increased traffic safety, and increased population health. 
Currently, the only HOV infrastructure that Michigan utilizes are carpooling parking lots, which are located by highway on-ramps throughout the state. So that is just a brief overview. Uh, we do have a couple groups that will be coming up to give a presentation, but I am uh, available for any questions you may have. It's Gerald. Uh, one question about the motorcycle um, aspect of this. Is that something that still requires two uh, riders on the motorcycle, or is this something that is utilized for safety of the motorcycles to remain at a consistent speed? I believe it is because of uh, it would need to have two riders, but I, like I said, I do have MDOT coming up, and they can clarify, but I believe it is that it's, uh, it needs two riders. But good question. Rep. Kuntz has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, are you representative or are you uh, chairman? How would you like to be addressed, sir? Nate. We're, we're going by Nate today. Outstanding. So. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> representative is fine. This might be a question for MDOT. It is, it is on the handout. Okay. So uh, only HOV lanes would only be on newly constructed lanes. No existing lanes would be closed. I'd, I, that would it, be a question for okay. MDOT, but Thank I you. know that we're really focused in on I-75 right now. Very good. Thank you. The new construction there. Thank you, Chairman Shannon. The committee will go at ease at the call of the chair. Thank you. The House Transportation Mobility and Infrastructure Committee will come to order. Continuing with testimony on HOV lanes, we have Troy Hagan, Colin Forbes, Deputy Region, Region Engineer, and Mark DeBay, Senior Project Manager, presenting for MDOT, as well as Leslie Jacobson, Senior Vice President, Transportation Operations Strategies, and Matt Omidian, Supervising Transportation uh, Engineer, with MSP to testify in support of the package. The floor is yours that I make sure I got everybody. I hope I did. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the House Transportation Mobility and Infrastructure Committee for having us today and for taking up uh, House Bills 4352 and 4353. I'd like to thank Chairman Shannon and Representative McDowell for sponsoring the legislation. As uh, we discussed in most of our, if not all of our meet and greet meetings with uh, each of you, this is uh, MDOT's number one legislative priority. Uh, for the beginning of the legislative term. Uh, so I'm glad that it's uh, finally in front of the committee and we are excited to be here today and discuss it. Uh, you, at your desk, you have a copy of the presentation and two handouts. One gen, uh, talks about HOV lanes in general and then one is specific to I-75. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with our uh, presentation and then we can um, go into any questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm Les Jacobson with WSP. Uh, in the state of Washington, WSP means Washington State Patrol, so whenever I, I talk to anybody from there, I make sure I say WSP USA, <laughs> just, just to make sure. Uh, I worked for the Washington State DOT for 22 years, and during that time, uh, we opened the first HOV lane in the, in the Seattle area, and I was involved in that program for the entire length of my, my career with, with, uh, with uh, Washington State DOT, and I've been uh, working on HOV projects uh, pretty much ever, ever since. Uh, so a high occupancy vehicle lane, or HOV, is really set up to allow preferential lanes for certain eligible vehicles. And we'll talk a little bit more about what, what the el eligible vehicles are. Uh, it's to really improve the efficiency of the performance and the throughput of the, the, the roadway network. Uh, it offers travel time 
uh, savings and reliability. That reliability improvement is actually good for all the lanes because it takes some of the traffic out of the general purpose lanes and puts them in, uh, in their own lane. Uh, and the management strategies that are used include vehicle uh, occupancy, how many people need to be in the vehicle, what vehicles are eligible, um, and also what we call access control. In other words, can people go in and out at any point, or, to, or are there designated places that they can come in or go out? So it really, uh, in I-75, this has been under discussion for, for quite some time, and it adds this option to Michigan that has been in place for over 40 years around the country. So I, I know that one of the things that, that probably is on your mind is how does an HOV lane differ from a flex lane and why would we do an HOV lane some places and a flex lane the other? Uh, I think the, the HOV lane adds a lane. Uh, it doesn't take away a shoulder. It's good for uh, locations where improved or increased capacity might be good at any time of day. You don't have to open or close a shoulder. Uh, it's, uh, the HOV restriction is only in place during the peak periods. Uh, and then it also is in, in place where it's a little bit easier to form a carpool off-peak. It's kind of difficult unless it's just part of your family to, to form a carpool. Um, and then, of course, it in, in includes that incentive to form a carpool. Flex lanes, on the other hand, provide the additional capacity by taking a shoulder. So you don't want to have that available all the time because there are, especially at low volume times, need to be able to get to a refuge area. Uh, and it's usually for kind of predictable congestion periods during the day is, is where they, they typically are, are uh, most successful. Um, so overall, there are more than 300 HOV lane facilities in the U.S. And the eligibility normally includes carpools and van pools. Uh, there are some facilities that have three-person requirements. Most of them are two-person requirements. Buses, motorcycles, um, and, and uh, I, sh I should say that the motorcycles, you don't have to have two riders, it's just any motorcycle. And it's something that uh, the, the, the federal law requires allowing motorcycles except in some limited and unusual situations. Emergency vehicles are usually allowed in as well, as, as well as law enforcement vehicles. Uh, so enforcement of the HOV requirements would be both by MSP and local law enforcement agencies that would normally uh, patrol or, or have jurisdiction over that stretch of I-75. Uh, we've worked with uh, law enforcement agencies. We've in, uh, developed an uh, enforcement plan that we'll be updating as soon as uh, there's any legislation passed that, that allows the HOV. Um, and there's also three areas within I-75 that have enforcement areas so that officers can be on the on the shoulder or on the HOV side of the roadway and be able to, to see uh, how, many how many people are in the vehicle and make it easier for them to, to uh, uh, stop the, the, any, anybody who's not, I, I hesitate to use the word violator, but <laughs> anybody who's, who's not in compliance with, with, uh, with the law. Um, and, and then there's also some uh, guidance on HOV lane performance to make sure that th those reliability and, and, and uh, travel time improvements continue. And that is the guideline uh, for an HOV lane is that they operate at 45 miles an hour or better, 90% of the peaks that are, that are there. So there's some uh, ways to make sure that the uh, HOV lane continues to be, uh, to be effective and efficient.
Yeah. Good morning and uh, thank you for having us. I'm Colin Forbes with the Metro Region. I'm the uh, Deputy Region Engineer, excuse me. <clears throat> I do wanna uh, just thank everyone for their continued uh, transportation support. I did hear a couple of the uh, comments, uh, some of the challenges getting in this morning. Uh, this is one of the department's largest years, not only the Department of Transportation, but our local partners, the counties, cities, and townships. And I appreciate the patience that everyone is giving us uh, as an industry. This is probably one of our biggest years ever. So thank you and I appreciate your patience. Uh, within Michigan, we have used an HOV lane one time so far, uh, not necessarily on a freeway, it was a local uh, a secondary route, Michigan Avenue. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, we did a large project on I-75 and the detour route, uh, we used Michigan Avenue. And to help reduce traffic and encourage uh, um, uh, carpooling, we uh, instituted a temporary HOV uh, for that purpose. Moving forward, there are uh, some opportunities, possibly in Grand Rapids on uh, the Division Street bus lane. We're also, of course, looking at uh, autonomous vehicles, um, automated vehicles, and we're looking for those opportunities and uh, possible partnerships. Uh, of course, we're here today uh, specifically to talk about Oakland County, the I-75 corridor uh, that is of significance to the department. As was mentioned, the law enforcement, state police, local police, they are gonna be able to um, um, monitor the lanes within those three, three areas, designated areas for them to do so. Uh, those are a break in the median barrier wall. If you drive the project and you'll notice the break in the uh, barrier wall, that's what those are for, also emergency response. As also as noted, violations, uh, section 907 of the Michigan Vehicle Code is what covers that. To continue on with the opportunity, specifically for I-75, I just wanted to give a little bit of a history of kind of how this all developed. In the late 1990s, there was the I-94 major investment study, which looked at HOV as an option but it was not deemed to be the proper corridor for this first HOV in Michigan. MDOT commissioned a Southeast Michigan HOV study to analyze all freeways for potential consideration. All Southeast Michigan freeways were analyzed for HOV viability in the study which was named the Southeast Michigan High Occupancy Vehicle Feasibility Study. Uh, this took place in May, 1990. The most viable HOV corridor identified was I-75 from 696 to M59 uh, M in both the AM and PM peak hours of travel. As the uh, uh, corridor progressed, environmental studies were conducted and the final impact statement for I-75 from uh, M102 to M59 in Oakland, Co Oakland County was approved in 2005 and was selected uh, for the HOV lane. A uh, record of decision was signed by FHWA in 2006. Uh, there was also two additional engineering reports uh, conducted throughout 2008 and 2010. Those allowed um, direction, you know, how we're gonna proceed with design and funding options. Um, that translated into the design modification report, which was conducted between 2011 and 2013. In the fall of, um, excuse me, between 2016 and the fall of 23, uh, the corridor, we've been under construction. You may recall that initially, the corridor was gonna be eight, eight sections, I believe, and we were gonna be completed in 2032, but then several years ago, uh, the decision to go to a P3, a public-private partnership, allowed us to definitely accelerate the entire project. So substantial completion will be later on uh, this fall. From 2020 to the present time, um, there, were, there are many reports that are developed uh, covering the HOV, HOV hours of operation, the enforcement plan, concepts of operation, and the monitoring plan. During this entire time, there has been ext uh, extensive public outreach. We uh, 
have our regular scheduled uh, stakeholder engagement meeting at the kickoff of every season. So we're in our, we just completed our fourth one uh, just three months ago. Uh, in addition, we've done other uh, specific public meetings on the HOV. Uh, just to make sure that everybody's informed and take that input if we needed to make any adjustments. Thank you. Morning, everyone. I'm Mark Dubay, Senior Project Manager with the Michigan Department of Transportation in the Metro Region. I got a couple slides here that I just want to focus a little bit more on the I-75 project itself and the need the immediate need for the HOV legislation. So I-75 modernization, as, as Colin said, and some of these bullets are here, you know, Colin touched on it and Les did as well, but, as well, but just kind of want to retouch on them as well. I-75 modernization is the reconstruction of I-75 from M-102 or 8 Mile north to M-59. And, you know, this, this project has been in development and planning for 20 plus years. And as part of that, there's, it is a very high volume urban corridor within Metro Region. You can see on this slide here, existing and projected future daily traffic. And part of the overall process was to, you know, with the modernization and, and widening of the freeway, look at an option that would improve travel, not just for personal, but also commercial goods within the corridor. So the HOV lane through a very rigorous environmental process was selected as the preferred alternative. It is the most environmentally friendly option to alleviate congestion in the area, which it'll increase capacity and travel demand. I think Les touched on this, so it'll, you know, the fourth lane will promote carpooling and, and ride sharing, and then, you know, reduce cars that are on the freeway and then also separating them out will provide additional capacity for general purpose lanes as well. So this should improve safety, efficiency, and reliability within the corridor. And then this slide here, just a little overview of the overall 75 modernization project. If anyone's not familiar with it, you can see, and it, it may be hard to see on the screen there, the I-696, I-75, Interchange is, is near the bottom, kind of below the blue highlighted section there. Eight miles at the bottom of the page, and then M59 is up near the top. So that's the overall I-75 modernization. We're, MDOT is delivering the reconstruction of the corridor through three projects. Segment one, which would be the red highlighted area. Segment two, which is the green highlighted area. Those projects have both been completed and are open to traffic. Segment three, the last piece that is under construction. We are in our final season of construction right now. We will get to substantial completion by August 31st, 2023. And at that time is when we will open up all lanes within the corridor to traffic. The HOV lane is currently planned to be from 12 mile north to M59, 12 miles south down to eight mile will be a general purpose lane. As Les said, it's going to be a peak hour HOV lane, so Monday through Friday, a.m., p.m. Peep, peak, 6 to 9 a.m. in the morning, 3 to 6 p.m. in the evening, all other hours, it will be a general purpose lane and can be used by anybody regardless of ridership in the vehicle. As part of this overall modernization, we are adding carpool lots at the, the northern end and the southern end of the project. There is a carpool lot which has been built and constructed up near Adams Road, which is in the segment one portion and then at the southern end of the HOV lane at 12 mile we are building two new carpool lots to support the ride sharing within the corridor and then last slide here just to talk a little bit about the HOV need and why we're here today you know overall this is a tool for MDOT to manage operations optimize efficiency and performance on our limited access interstate system Specifically, you know, the immediate need would be the I-75 project as we come to completion of construction this fall. September 1st, we are intending to open all lanes within the corridor. We currently do not have authority to designate HOV lanes, which would limit our ability to open the fourth lane from 12 mile north to M59. And, and there are some implications with that as well. This would put us in non-compliance with the the environmental documents and could impact the 
federal funding that has been allocated toward the project, i.e. MDOT could have to reimburse federal funds that were used to construct the HOV lane if we cannot open it up as intended upon substantial completion of the overall I-75 modernization project. That was, that was all I had. We're happy to take any uh, questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, Ms. I'm sorry, Representative Roth. Thank you, gentlemen. First of all, I can't compare our roads to Washington State. I've driven I-5. They'll let you in on a merge. <laughs> they will stop or slow down to let you in on a merge. So that's not Michigan. I appreciate it. Just giving me a little hard time there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me the question. Just trying to visualize this lane a little bit more. And I'm misunderstanding. Can we close it? Can we not close it ever? I, um, and is this a barricaded lane or just simply a painted lane that we're talking about? And if it's generally around a 45 mile an hour speed limit ish, it tends to be a slower lane. Uh, why would I want to be in it? But I think th there's a there's misunderstanding. A couple, couple questions there. So it yeah. is. It will not be a barrier separated lane. It will be a, a paint separated lane. Um, and the maybe less if you want to touch on the overall speed. So the, in, the intent is for it to not operate at you know 45. That, that would be the, the minimum, minimum operating speed of the lane. So when, when the corridor is congested, maybe the, the throughput general purpose lanes aren't moving, the intent here would be to keep the people in the HOV lane moving at a minimum of 45 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, and the only place, places that uh, vehicles could not enter and exit are in the S-curves where it's kind of dangerous to, to move in. So those will be striped to not allow lane changes in, in, in that area. Uh, other than that, it's, it's open. The closing part, can you close this lane yeah. if need be? You, I, I guess we could close it like we would close any other lane on the interstate. So when it's Monday through Friday peak hour, so 6 to 9 in the morning, and then in the evening it will operate as an HOV. Outside of those hours it will be a general purpose lane, so you would use it as you would any other lane within the I-75 corridor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Conlon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen, for the presentation. I have lived in a lot of places with an HOV lane. They are the best thing ever. The feeling when all of a sudden the traffic is slowing down, and you realize you've got more than one person in your vehicle, and you can get in that HOV line and just pass all the sad people who are singular in that car <laughs> is so excellent. I will say, watch out. There are some times where people talked about blow-up passengers, so tell the Michigan State Police to watch out for that because it's a way you trick it. Um, is there, si will there be really great signage so people understand that, you know, like showing two people or something so people understand because obviously right now I come up on 96, there's that extra lane that I can never use, but um, it's not for HOV. But uh, so as long as the signage is good, I think that can help. But also uh, how many other states do have this now? Uh, the number of states is probably, I, I haven't counted for a while, but it's probably in the, in the uh, 20 or more. Uh, 300. There's 300 different HOV lanes, yeah. So, oh, and then, yeah, so the, the lane will be signed, it will have, um, large overhead cantilever signs, so similar to advanced warning signs for like if you were coming up onto an exit like one mile ahead, it'll be HOV and it'll be a large cantilever style sign that is that is over the actual HOV lane and there will be advanced signing as well as signing where the HOV lane begins and ends. And then in between the large overhead signs, we will have smaller barrier mounted signs that are along the overall whole corridor. And it will also be supplemented with pavement markings as well, designating the HOV lane. In addition, so the entire communication aspect and getting this word out there is something that uh, we're getting very practiced at. So uh, there is, we've already been working on that, how we're going to get it out to the public, some YouTube videos, other 
media uh, uh, attention that we can get to it so people can get educated and know before they even get out there. So we're going to provide those opportunities. One of the unique aspects of this project is its own website, which we've been able to put a lot of information out there and through social media directing people to these videos. So we're already in progress and we're, we're, we're anticipating ho hopefully to get that out shortly. And it really does promote um, ride sharing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Representative St. Germain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just one quick question. Would there still be what is supposed to be a passing lane? Would we still have a passing lane? So that, like the HOV lane and then what I call passing lane. So I think that probably on the way up as you come up 96 and we're down to two lanes and we do have signs that say, you know, uh, left lane for passing only, something like to that effect. Once you get into an urban area and you're three to four lanes, that necessarily isn't necessarily the law. So to have a passing lane, I, I don't think that's a, 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 um, something in an urban area. The, um, we're still going to have the three lanes and the fourth lane, anybody can use the fourth lane during uh, uh, non-peak hours, but it's during those peak hours that Yes, it, it's intended to be used for multiple people in a vehicle. Um, so I, I'm going to say yes, but, but just also that a true passing lane isn't necessarily uh, in an urban freeway like this. I, I guess... Um, Fast lanes in yeah. Detroit Metro ha living there, yes, the, generally the left lanes are the passing lanes, the okay. fast lanes, gotcha. and, uh, but that's not an official... Uh, uh, Definition, I I'll guess I'll say. Fair less? Yeah, I was going to say the, uh, the lanes really operate very similarly to any four-lane section with the, with the exception that the HOV lane during hours of operation have to be HOVs, uh, but that's usually the fastest lane during those times anyway. Uh, Representative Fitzgerald. Thank you, Chair. Um, so because it's in the handout that we were provided here with your deck, you, you mentioned here um, a potential site on the west side of the state, uh, which is uh, included in my district, which was is the Division, Division Street bus lane. And I'm curious about how that was identified or how that was brought into today's discussion, um, especially as another uh, slide here talks about the best opportunity for these to to be utilized is with I think 45 mile an hour or greater speeds um, can you talk about the the differentiation the differentiation here between the bus lane that really is operating in more of a 30 to 40 mile an hour district as opposed to the 45 mile an hour uh, I don't know target speed if you will or, or best utilization speed uh, based on that suggestion so the 45 mile per hour uh, average target is really just for freeways. So there are bus lanes and HOV lanes and arterials that don't have that, that kind of guidance at all. Okay. I, I do have a follow-up question to the colleague who spoke uh, before, which with regard to the, the passing lane and, and more or less the flow of traffic is, the existing roads that we have then, should these be elected to be utilized, they can essentially be retrofitted. There's not, an, uh, there's not need for additional engineering or construction to allow for greater uh, flow of traffic. I understand that there may be cantilevered you know, signage and the like, but not necessarily additional surface area for travel. That could be done. Uh, it has been done in the past. Uh, Everywhere, almost everywhere that I'm aware of where they took a general purpose lane and converted it to an HOV lane uh, was very controversial. And uh, I think the, the driving public is okay with adding something that is for preferential treatment, but for taking something away as they see it, uh, restricting them for something from something that they've had 
uh, usually is, is not a very popular idea. Okay. Thank you. Well, I have Representative Kuntz up next, but I think uh, Representative Fitzgerald may have taken your question. <laughs> okay, you sure? Okay, thank you. Committee members, any other questions? Thank you so much for your presentation today. I really do appreciate the information. Uh, I need a motion to excuse absent members. Representative Kuntz moves to excuse absent members. There being no objection, the motion prevails by unanimous consent. There being no further business before the committee, the committee will stand adjourned. <laughs>